Okay, you need to understand one thing. The way you are staring at the camera, a lot of people are talking about it. So please, don't stare too much. They are knowing too much about you. Okay, stay there. Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video. And in this video, we're gonna talk about a recent article posted by Facebook, which titles says, Rebuilding our tech stack for, for the new Facebook.com. And in case you follow me up on Instagram, the way the day this article came on, I posted a story on my Instagram about it. A lot of you love that, that, that there's so much to read and learn from this article, but a lot of you got confused as well with some of the vocabulary being used in this one. I'll try to simplify this article, not entirely, but some chunks of it so that you can get more knowledge and insight about how things are happening, what is the mindset behind handling such a big and massive scale product. Let's go ahead and get started. This article is directly by Facebook engineering team and the, as the URL you can see, engineering.fb.com. And they, the article title says, Rebuilding our tech stack for the new Facebook.com. And they start with the article by saying, previously it was just a simple PHP website where people come out and post and now eventually with the modern features and modern uh, new look and everything that's going on, they need to redesign everything, which is not really a small thing. Now, I would like to mention a point here it doesn't really mean that Facebook is leaving PHP doesn't mean PHP is going anywhere. It's still rock solid. It's still capable of serving thousands and thousands of products and websites. Doesn't mean PHP is going anywhere. It's just the scale of Facebook is now at such a big scale that they have to move on onto something new or create something new that can help them in serving so much of user. Do you really realize the data and the users that Facebook is having? They're just one day users is a dream of many startup. It's really a big number. Moving on, I posted about this entire article on the very next day it came out on the page. And this is the reason you should be following me up on Instagram because I post a lot of stories which can be really, really helpful in getting to know what's happening in this. Now moving further on this, apart from uh, telling the story in this article about how Facebook moved from PHP to the new tech stack, which is React and Relay. Now, one thing you should know about all of these big tech giants is there are a whole lot of tools that they use internally, which are not released to public and probably in the later on future, they release them in public. React is one of such things. Now, in the later on article, you're going to realize if you skip a couple of paragraphs about getting started, you're going to realize that in the rethinking CSS to unlock uh, new capabilities, this section, they mention about such tools pretty openly here, which I really appreciate. So every single company has some of the tool sets internally designed, which can help their internal engineers in writing modern CSS and whole bunch of other things as well. So they clearly mention here that we have our own split tool, which in which you write CSS just like you write JavaScript. And this tool splits the CSS into two different parts, helping in optimizing. What is going to catch your attention is the next paragraph, which we are gonna stay here for this entire video. It says generating atomic CSS to reduce the home page by 80%. Now this number is really crazy, 80%. Imagine if I'm able to produce videos 80% faster than I'm producing right now, I would be doing absolutely fantastic job. But 80% is really big. What confused a lot of people and I received a lot of messages on Instagram is about what is this atomic CSS? We are, we are hearing about it for the very first time. So in this video, I would like to demystify the whole concept of what is atomic CSS and at least you'll have some of the basic knowledge about what atomic CSS, what it can do and should you be using it or not. Let's go ahead and talk about this one. First and foremost, let's talk about the challenges that a company at the scale of Facebook is going to be facing up. Now, two major, of course, there are a lot of challenges. The two major challenges a company at a scale of Facebook is facing up. First is foremost is scalability. The company need to write code which is insanely scalable, like every single day new users are coming up. And the second biggest challenge is the new features. Company all the time comes up with a new feature. So the two big challenges are scalability and adding new feature. What also in the sideline I would like to mention, as soon as you add a single new feature, that means the new interface is gonna come in. New interface means more code. And if the interface is going on web, that means a whole lot of new CSS is gonna be written up for that. Okay, so now you understand what, what are the challenges. Moving forward, if you'll read this article a little bit more, you're gonna realize that there are major three problems on which they are trying to attack. The first is leanability of the code. 
Now, one of the major is issue, especially in the CSS, is the dead weight. Because let's just say you're writing a simple component, a button or a form, and that form is something that you want to look at specifically. Now, already there is a ton of CSS that is already there. And on top of that, you're writing your own CSS as well. But you are also bringing that CSS in your component because rest of the page need to have it. So you cannot directly go ahead and change that CSS. That's one problem. And you are also writing your own CSS. That brings some of the dead CSS which needs to be there, but it's not actually working the way you want it to be. So this brings a whole lot of CSS which is totally dead, but still needs to be there. And this dead weight can pile up pretty easily if you're designing new features. And for a company which is at the Facebook scale is worrying a lot about the leanability of their code. Issue number two, the portability. Let's just say you have designed a button or maybe anything else and you are taking that button and pasting it somewhere else, then it's not gonna work exactly like how you are thinking for it because there is gonna be a whole lot of CSS which is already there and it might be hindering with your button. So portability is really a big issue. And again, thinking it with a different perspective, if all the CSS attached for that button or being written for that button actually moves along with the button, then it's much more predictable that what's going to happen. Along with that, the code movability is also there. Predictability also is given there. Again, I'm not asking you to just agree with my point or not agree with my point. I'm just telling you what's in the article. Feel free to disagree, but this is what Facebook engineers are thinking and this is what they have already done. And the third point, obviously we have already talked about it, which is predictability. So along with the portability, the predictability of the code that how CSS is gonna behave is also there. So they came up with a solution, which is obviously not my favorite one, but again, it is nothing to do with what's my favorite or what's your favorite. It is the solution that they have already implemented. Now here comes the Atomic CSS, and they mentioned this in their article, that Atomic CSS has log growth curve, which is pretty decent for a size of Facebook and it's because it's proportional to the number of unique style declaration. And you can read more about it here. Now, what is Atomic CSS? First and foremost, that's a big question here. Now, before we move ahead and talk about the Atomic CSS, let me mention some of the things and feelings that I personally have about Atomic CSS. First and foremost, it's painful. Yes, it's so painful to write Atomic CSS that you're going to feel almost like somebody is squeezing your neck. It's that dead painful to me at least. Not only that, it also I sometimes feel that it's not really dry and it follows the dry principle. So you actually repeat yourself a lot in that Atomic CSS. And on top of that, it is so much hard to read, not to mention to learn as well. It is absolutely insanely hard to read at, for the beginner especially. Once you get a hold of things, then surely it might become easier later on. But these are my personal thoughts about Atomic CSS. But hey, Tish, what is this Atomic CSS? Now, Atomic CSS is not something really fancy and new CSS. It's just a way of writing the code. It's just a style of writing the CSS. In Atomic CSS, we think of CSS like more over a programming language. We like to think it more variable-ish, like you can define things, you can change things on the go. And the whole concept behind the Atomic CSS is one line of CSS for one style. Not basically one line, but one, one rule for one styling. Let's just say you want to have a border on, the, on any element. There is gonna be specific CSS just talking about borders. Let's just say you want to have rounded corners, one CSS for one rounded corner, that's it. If you want to have rounded corners for two, two M's, then it's gonna be two M's just there. I know two M is really big, but again, just an example. Now let me take you on the screen on my computer and walk you through that how Atomic CSS actually looks like and you're gonna quickly realize that it's not really easy. But again, it's not about what I feel or what you feel, this is already being happening there. Now surely Atomic CSS has got some of its great advantage like if you want to go on black theme or white theme or dark mode or green mode, you know what, never, you know what, trends change a lot so there might be chances of blue mode and green mode maybe in future, who knows. So these kinds of things are pretty easy to implement in the Atomic CSS, not to mention in other frameworks too, but this is what they are thinking. Now let me take you on the screen first and show you how it actually looks like. Yep, this is what we'll be building up. Not even building, we'll be just talking about it. Concept videos, it just need to explain the stuff. We don't need to always build the stuff. Okay, 
So in this concept, I just want to mention that we will be just putting up some lorem ipsum text. I want to show you how atomic CSS looks like. So this is the basic HTML that I've got, nothing super extraordinary. The extraordinary thing starts from the styling part, the CSS, a basic styling CSS. First and foremost, notice this capital letter. And this is one of the thing which is always there in atomic CSS. Again, you can override the rule, but this is a general thing. And by the way, there are two approaches of the atomic CSS, the general one and the programmatic approach. This is the more programmatic approach, which you're gonna see and which you're gonna see many companies adopting. So again, these are just approaches. So first and foremost, we notice here that says BGC for background color. And then we have these weird slashes going on. The, the reason behind these weird slashes is, uh, if I don't put up these slashes, my CSS doesn't, doesn't really recognize these parentheses and these hashes. So in order to just kind of get rid of those effect, I have to use these escape characters behind these, these, and the final one. So that's why these weird slashes here and there. Apart from that, the property, the single property that is mentioned in this is this background color and this exact same color is being mentioned. The same thing happens with this one as well. So if I want to use a color of white, this is how it is being mentioned and notice just single style is mentioned here. If I want to have a padding of 20 pixels, this is one of what the style looks like. If I want to have a padding of 10 pixels, then I have to again write a CSS. So I have to write uh, something like this, copy this and paste it again. And this time this one is gonna be 10 pixels and this one is gonna be 10 pixels. So again, this is really painful to write, but again, this gives you some of the sureties that you may argue the pros and cons for it. Now how we use it in the index.html is something like this. If I want to implement any class, I can simply go ahead and say BGC and then just like this. So it gives a more programmatic approach and especially if you have some of the internal tools, then writing this kind of CSS or producing this kind of CSS is much more easier in that manner. Of course, you're gonna notice something very weird here that if you want to have multiple properties here, then it's gonna build up a really long chain of classes in that. Obviously this is gonna go whole crazy scenario into inspect element and inspecting the thing is not gonna be really fun. But this is what the atomic CSS is and you get guessed it right. It's painful to write it unless and until you have a crafted tool to write it, uh, designed internally in your company or maybe by third party. And again, producing this kind of CSS is painful. But again, this is what we have got. So there we go. We have studied a little bit about what is mentioned on the engineering Facebook page. And this is just one or two paragraphs that we have discussed. Now I post a lot of such information and informative article in the stories of my Instagram. So it's a good thing that you follow me up there as well. And definitely I'll come up with more such videos which gives you more information about what's happening, what's not happening, some of the crash courses and lot of stuff. So go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna catch up in the next video. I told you not to stare that much. People are noticing. So in the next video, I'll replace you with something else, okay? Mm. Just for the okay. next video. Okay, deal. Think it's about time for me to go in. Like I dive deep. Like I'm last week night with the flow here. Johnny boy, my peeps. I'm an infotainment stain. My brain ain't contained.